Okay, it looks like the numbers are stabilizing. So let's commence the lecture. So before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the land on which this meeting is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the locations of us and you. I pay my respects to both leaders of the past, present, and extended the respect to other Indigenous Australians with us. So welcome to the first lecture of the A Visiting School 2021. This year we'll have a fantastic lineup of lectures, as you may know, um, and you can continue to register with all the upcoming lectures, the five other lectures series. Tonight, we are very glad that we have Christina Vavia with us. And before we invite Christina to talk, I'd like to invite Mon Q, who's the director of A Visiting School Melbourne, who also curated this series, the lecture public lecture series. And Mon will introduce Christina. Mon, can I pass it to you? Thank you, Paul. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Christina Vavia. Her unique and bold journey in what architecture can be is inspiring, real, and it deals with so many political, societal, and global issues that are hyper relevant today. Christina is currently a research fellow and formerly the deputy director of forensic architecture. Trained as an architect, Christina has taught at the Architecture Association and is currently pursuing a PhD at Aarhus University, which she has received the Nova Nodisk Foundation PhD scholarship. She's also a fellow at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. And today she'll be presenting on the concept of operative models, which delves into a variety of ways that model making can be used politically while serving investigative practices. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Christina Bavia. Hello everyone. It is a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for the warm introduction by both Mond and Paul. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be uh, in the same room with you as um, we all somehow are stranded this year, but this uh, lecture and this meeting has been, it's been a long time coming. So today I will try to to show you some of the work that I've been doing, some of the work that has been derived from forensic architecture, as well as from the um, AA uh, diploma unit that I was running. And uh, maybe I start with sharing my screen and we can, we can talk more about it. As, we, as uh, I was saying, uh, I think today would make sense to, to talk a little bit about uh, the work of forensic architecture, some of its uh, affiliate work, but also do a little bit more of a deep dive on one of the cases, which hopefully will help you understand the, the kind of layers of work and methodologies that are involved in doing this type of work. Um, so very briefly, forensic architecture, traditionally what forensic architecture means is a, a sort of reading of ruins of buildings, such as this one, the one you see on your screen, trying to figure out what happened from the traces. What, what, uh, what, what was it that caused this building to get destroyed? Was it airstrikes, artillery, tank fire, or um, you know, was it bulldozed down? This is the kind of traditional understanding of forensic architecture as a surveying of, of buildings. However, increasingly, we do not have access to the sites of violations, but we have to rely on media that is derived from those places and work remotely. So we have devised a, a set of techniques to analyze and cross-reference materials that come from conflict in order to figure out what happened in these events. Is it the same building that has been bombed, for example, in this, um, in this case? This sort of work is only possible, of course, uh, because of the proliferation of cheap recording devices and the immediacy of social platforms. So I'm quickly going to run through some of those techniques. We, were, we work very much with open source materials, both techniques, code methods, as well as objects of, of investigations. For example, here we scour online platforms and find photographs of fragments of bombs. We measure them and study their distortion through, through the physical distortion, but also their media distortion in order to figure out how they fit within the blueprints of bombs such as this one, which was leaked from uh, the Russian foreign ministry. This is a chemical bomb that 
that uh, was uh, thrown in Syria. Um, on another occasion, we discovered the presence of American soldiers, for example, in Cameroon, in a military base where we know that torture takes place because the American soldiers kept their location tags on and their private privacy settings loose on Facebook. So we saw that American soldiers were training Cameroonian special forces um, in order to, in the use of, of night goggles, in the same place where we have reports of torture and humane treatment. So this acts as evidence, obviously, and this is very much what forensic architecture is about, creating ways to cross-reference materials in order to provide evidence for human rights violations and environmental uh, injustice. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar with our work, we also present uh, work as such in a variety of forums from national and international courts to um, um, tribunals, people's tribunals, to parliamentary inquiries, but also in exhibitions and with the media. And we, we, we are quite strategic about the use of these forums. Our practice is uh, very much uh, at the core of it, let's say, it's uh, a certain relationship between space and media. It is about unpacking mediatized space back in its three and four dimensions and perhaps the way that space is distorted or mitigated through these lenses that it has traveled through. So understanding how mediatized pieces of evidence become political objects, we are thinking about ways of, of using models um, models that we often, in like this case, we call the architectural media complex, which essentially reveals a certain um, spatial and temporal relationship between different pieces of, of uh, evidence, different pieces of footage often, but also um, different pieces of testimony and narrative, etc. So we work from situated and partial perspectives. And sometimes we don't have any images, but only the memory of witnesses who survived to work with. We then use a process that we call situated testimony in order to reconstruct the space of incarceration and torture, for example, here in this um, Syrian uh, prison uh, in Sednaya, where we have, uh, we, found, we have found that using this technique and asking people to focus on spatial details uh, on, for example, the sizes of tiles, the textures of walls, etc. Witnesses remember more by by really focusing in on those details and can describe more details of the, of their experience. We have also uh, used this technique with the use of VR goggles, which offers more immersion and a, a kind of a, a different way of entering into a space of memory and a space of of um, of uh, violence, which. Uh, I would say we would have to be really careful with because we also don't want to kind of re-emerge um, the survivors into, into a dangerous uh, psychological space and re-traumatize them. But in this case, uh, it has really helped um, create a certain recollection and, and provide specificity to the account uh, by really allowing um, a, a kind of certain spatial a recollection and a special way of giving um, a narrative testimony. We also work with machine learning algorithms that we train in order for them to recognize certain images of objects of interest, like this tear gas canister, for example, that was produced by Safariland, a company that is owned by the former vice chairman of the Whitney Museum. And so we did this work in order to challenge um, the, the accountability of uh, Warren Kanders, the, the chairman of the Whitney Museum, after we were invited to present uh, work in the Whitney Biennial. It is very important to also question the places that we, we are participating, the institutions that we are involved in. And so this is the work that was derived from that. And um, finally, we've also done very much work with uh, physical modeling, and in this case, a real scale one-to-one -one modeling uh, that we use for the investigation of Khalid Yozgat, um, the investigation of the killing of Khalid Yozgat by the National Socialist Underground, the NSU, which is a neo-Nazi organization in Germany. And here we reconstructed this site in order to reenact and investigate the testimony of a Secret Service agent who was present at the internet cafe that was the site of the killing. I'm not going to go into more detail on these cases, but I wanted to showcase just a few of the, the different ways that we use modeling um, as a, an investigatory, an investigative practice. 
I'm also going to uh, quickly show you some of the projects that were derived from the units that I was running with Marvanil uh, for a couple of years at the AA. And there we are also engaging with architectural investigations, but also we have a little bit more freedom when it comes to proposition. So the unit um, also uses, in principle, the targeted inter interventions within political space. Similar to the forensic architecture work, we think about forums, we think about where the projects can create maximum impact. And I will quickly run through some of these projects in a way, uh, kind of picking on the way that modeling, again, is used as a way to simulate, investigate either the truth of past incidents of conflict or the possibility of new types of political schemas. So within an architectural studio, the commitment to proposition demands a certain sharpening of the political agenda to propose, as I understand it and as we understand it, and I hope um, this is something that uh, you take away from this talk, to propose for us means to take a position. And although arch architects often consider themselves as apolitical in this unit, uh, we very much focus primarily on how to imagine differently political setups by examining spatial and temporal conditions. So modeling therefore has been um, a critical positioning tool for us, one that analyzes perspectives and suggests a different way of framing. So very quickly, um, I'll show you some work. Lola Conte's project, for example, was looking at the use of video link in court cases and the way that technology interferes with the concept of habeas corpus, of the body needing to be present in court and uh, the due processes that are involved with that. She realized that the people most um, that were most negatively affected from the use of this technology were asylum seekers who had to step onto UK soil to have the right to claim asylum, yet were forced to only attend the courts through video link. She studied the way that the mediatization of trials was undermining the de and dehumanizing the defendants, and she submitted an expert report to the Justice Committee inquiry. Finally, her project reimagined how this technology could reconfigure the justice matrix and challenge the necessity of border crossings at all. So video link includes the affordance of applying for asylum before and without actually having to undertake perilous journeys. So she modeled an, a, a setup where this mediatization would work on the favor of the asylum claimers. Another project that is perhaps close to home there in Australia, Jack Isles project was looking into the deep earth sensing technology of magnetotellurics, which is used in Australia's remote landscapes for resource extraction. He studied the way that this technology challenges conceptions of land through visualizing it as potential capital and thus informing neocolonial practices which will further hinder Aboriginal rights. So he developed a way that the same optics could be used in a campaign to inform practices of resistance and explain the risks of deployment of uh, this technology specifically. So simulating the way that the land itself is visualized through this technology allows us to understand the extractivist uh, logic and uh, take back the terms of conversation. In the second year of our studio, we had uh, a more targeted focus on the human body and the way its material construct could be used to study biopolitical practices. This is drawing from uh, Foucault's theory of biopolitics, which um, basis, um, which understands the, the basis of, um, of politics to be the administration of bare life. This is kind of the essence of political governance in, in, his, uh, in his words. And so, this is also a kind of a, a longer project that I'm, I'm taking forward now in my PhD and I would very much like to hear your thoughts on this, but it really sprang from this um, year at, at this unit where we experimented with, um, with uh, different technologies and ways of visualizing the body. So the students were really encouraged to think of imaging techniques of the human body to work interscalarly and to trace material substances as a way of uh, to reveal political forces within the body. So in this case, Farah Bisra um, traced remnants of TNT from airstrikes in Syria, and Carson Long uh, analyzed the way um, the use of tear gas um, in Hong Kong in the protests. Calvin Poe here 
uh, mapped out the way that Brexit was challenging the whole notion of a nation state by mapping out the complex institutional infrastructure that is at play in Northern Ireland when one is seeking an abortion, for example, or if one is going through a process of gender recognition. So the border in this case is felt through the body and the way that the body gains access to different services. And this kind of mappings allows to understand how um, this takes shape. Calvin imagined an alternative solution to the problem of a nation state and proposed the sovereignty that is carried by each body individually. This is, of course, a proposal that is flirting with anarchy in a sense, but it's doing so in a very uh, uniquely architectural way. If the territorial border no longer defines the laws uh, one has to abide by, but we carry the border within the limits of our skin, then the city is configured in a collage of different sovereignties, often played out in the scale of architectural detail. So this is quite a, a different way of thinking of architecture and politics and, and even kind of drawing and planning. Um, finally, from, from this series, um, Shu Tianzhu's project studied the byproducts, sorry, the byproducts of the one child policy in China. And here she plotted the production of iron and uh, agriculture against the birth rate. She discovered that a child would only get an ID after the mother had an IUD contraceptive implanted. If the mother refused or if families had a second child and could not afford to pay the fine, then the child could be undocumented. So the 6.9 million children that were undocumented in China from this process form a cheap labor force that has no rights in the eyes of the state. So in this, in this cheap kind of workforce, um, it is, actually, it is actually this cheap workforce that has created cities such as Shenzhen with its rapid urbanization. And Xu Tian's film presents Shenzhen through this double lens. Um, through, on the one hand, the financial center with luxury apartments that attracts a high class. On the other hand, a marketplace for unregistered workers who work for less than minimum wage producing the stuff of the world. So you see this um, concentration on the body at large tries to combine biopolitical and neo-materialist thinking within an architectural project and demands a certain type of specificity as well as a, a certain kind of positionality in the project. So within both the FE and in the unit, we kind of reject uh, this idea that architectural is apolitical, as I mentioned before, or that is such a thing as objective truth. Instead of advocating for an objective truth, this investigation studied the, govern the provenance of, um, of evidentiary, evidentiary materials and reveal their agendas. So we, by repositioning, recomposing, and working out the spatial implications of these partial perspectives, we advocate for a polyperspectival way of viewing the world that is inherently political and where we can demand more from our kind of political uh, leaders. Modeling, essentially, for us, allows for such an analysis. To model, um, as I understand it, is to create nonlinear associations where multiple scenarios can be simulated. The model is thus a kind of an open, for, an open form that invites the viewer to judge for themselves. So I think with this, I will kind of um, transition into talking a little bit more specifically about one case that uh, really sprang from, from this unit in collaboration with Forensic Architecture. This is um, a project that's uh, in Chicago, an investigation in Chicago that was that originally was a group investigation by uh, the students uh, in the unit uh, in Diploma 3 at the AA, and that was then taken on board by Forensic Architecture um, and was kind of expanded into a multi-part uh, series. So let me tell you um, all about uh, the killing of Harith Augustus. And here I also want to um, give a little bit of a trigger warning because this investigation includes um, a visual imagery, graphic imagery of um, a, a man being shot by police. So, so your discretion is really advised. Please um, 
look away if if you're feeling like you you don't want to take on a little bit of difficult imagery at the moment we have to be really careful with how much we expose ourselves to that but um with that i i kind of start to to describe um the way that our work took us to the south shore of chicago where on the 14th of july 2018 a black barber called Harith Augustus, was shot and killed by Chicago police um, because he was carrying a gun. And it is important to note that Chicago is within the state of Illinois, which allows the carrying of concealed weapons for individuals with a license. So we undertook this work with a, a local group of investigative journalists that is called the Invisible Institute. Two days after the shooting, the police superintendent, Eddie Johnson, held a press conference where he re released body camera footage of the incident. He said this when asked about the incident. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to fluff anything. The video speaks so for this itself. This question of the video speaks for itself. He also released this uh, video in order to, to kind of appease the public that was enraged with uh, yet another killing of a black man. So please note that this is uh, the video that, that shows uh, the killing. Um, so the police uh, released it uh, titled Aggravated Assault to a Police Officer, note the title. And in fact, the video is edited. It freezes and zooms to highlight Harith Augusta's gun. And this acted as a justification of the killing. So we chose to work with this case, not because it is one where the police are clearly at fault, but because the incident falls in the gray zone. And it is this sort of killing that the Chicago Police Department and perhaps even the courts would consider justified and therefore lawful. So the question we would like to ask is why would someone be killed for carrying a gun at the state that allows the carrying of concealed weapons? This is again, Eddie Johnson's response decision to use lethal force is made in a split second and it's based on the safety of the officer and also that surrounding community so this argument of the split second somehow conceals um the decisions and and kind of deflects accountability so we set out to investigate a split second decision and what it is to um and how we could deconstruct and reconstruct it that split second within multiple time frames of the histories entangled in that incident. We conducted an investigation in six parts through the temporal lenses of days, hours, minutes, milliseconds and milliseconds, but also years. And I will quickly run you through the, those. Um, in the days, we started by analyzing the narrative um, that was constructed slowly after the days um, uh, the days that followed. So reports by the police that um, highlight that note Harith Augustus as an offender and Dylan Halley who shot Harith as a victim already are kind of forcing a certain narrative. Um, then in, in the minutes we started by collecting all available body cameras, CCTV cameras, police observation cameras and uh, Note that in Chicago, it is necessary to release all footage that relates to police killing within 60 days of the incident. We synchronized all of these cameras and situ situated them within the model, which allowed us to kind of navigate um, between them. We used the precise matching of the footage to a 3D model in order to reconstruct and analyze the very choreography of bodies in space. This is the, the technique that I referred earlier as the image complex. And like that, we're able to piece together gestures of partially captured um, images of, of, that were captured by different perspectives. On this basis, we essentially analyzed the whole event from the moment that um, Harith passed by police and uh, what uh, is called the investigative stop, the investigatory stop began. Because the footage um, originally does not have any sound, we subtitled the footage with statements that the police gave. So here I'm very briefly going to run you through it. Um, Harith is being um, kind of um, uh, pulled aside, asked about his, his gun. Uh, we notice it's a, the, the shop saying there's no gun policy. Harith pulls out his wallet, 
and he's trying to demonstrate something. But at the same time, Megan Fleming um, reaches over and tries to grab Harith, grabs him by, by his wrist. We see this perspective from a top view in order to understand what it's like from a more um, impartial perspective, so to speak. So we see him being cornered. We also see his, his card that he's trying to take out, which is a fire, firearms owner's identification card. We later find out that he has a license to own a gun, but not to carry one. But what you see here is the way that he's really cornered in order to be handcuffed and also the way that he snaps out of, of this kind of lock because of course he doesn't trust the police. He lives in a neighborhood that has a um, disproportionately uh, high amount of, of police violence and police brutality. So he snaps out of this and as he's, he's uh, running away, there's a brief moment that he almost he looks like he might be touching his gun and this is when he's shot and killed. So then we zoom into the, um, the milliseconds and the granularity of the image frame. Um, a duration of a frame is, um, the duration of a frame is analogous, of course, in the frame rate of the footage. This matter because this is our pixel of time, so to speak, and it is a unit of information capture. And here, we're, what we're trying to do is move backwards from the moment that the shot is fired. We're trying to figure out when was it the decision that, uh, that the police officer, when, when did the police officer decide to pull the trigger? So here we work with a um, uh, neuroscientist, Diago Branco, who works with us in a way to, to reconstruct how long it takes for someone to take this decision from the moment of, of kind of um, parsing out the visual information to taking the decision to, to fire for, for how long it takes for the, the finger, to, to, for the signal to go from the brain to the finger and, and for the trigger to be pulled. So I'd like to, to play for a second Tiago's voice here that explains in his own words as a neuroscientist what it is, um, what a split second decision looks like, what, how does it operate within the brain. The question is, was the shooter reacting to when a particular event that led him to press the trigger, that you might call a split-second decision if you want. Though I think the term is actually a bit misleading because it comes on the back of this escalation essentially, which in this model of decision-making would be you're already pretty close to your threshold and then you just need a little something else to take you over the threshold. And um, finally, we do a comparative analysis where we show how each of the five police officers reacted in order to, to really explain that it is the two police officers that were younger, the one that reached out and grabbed Harith and the other one that pulled the trigger, that were still in their probation, that acted um, in a way that had escalated the event um, and created this tension that led to his death. So this points towards a policing mistake rather than a justified killing. And you see this because the more experienced police officers are clearly having a much more a calm down uh, approach. We also want to question uh, what it is to have the perspective of the police, uh, of the police body camera, which makes us identify with the body of the police officer, which makes us kind of connect with the small movements of their body, with the anxiety that comes from that, that makes, makes it feel like this is a threat to the police. So we do this by kind of creating a speculative visualization where we reverse the gaze, and modeling also allows us to almost kind of put eyes in the, in the body of Harith and see what he would be seeing in this incident. Of course, um, it goes without saying that we cannot really know what, what it was like for him and we cannot really know what, what it was like to, to be and, and see this incident, but it's a gesture in order to explain um, how also threatening it is from his side to see um, five police officers and, and guns in, in your face at this moment. Finally, um, our work and with after repeated uh, freedom of information requests, we also, uh, there was another footage that was released from a dash camera uh, next, to, next to the killing. And, uh, and this shows really a completely different perspective where the, the shooter 
the, the police officer actually looks quite aggressive. And you can also see in detail that he shoots um, three times and pauses and then shoots another time. So there's a moment where he's reconsidering and it's really kind of a, a shooting to kill. But so this exposes also not only the way that that um, the police has made this this mistake um, and and kind of what led to the killing, but also the concealment of evidence after the fact. This is a, a footage that hasn't been released, even though it should be according to to the law in Chicago. Um, on the hours chapter, we conducted an interview with one of the invisible incident met, uh, members, Trina Reynold Tyler. Um, who participated to the protest after the killing. And the, and the protest essentially were also met with police brutality. So here we use this technique that I mentioned, um, uh, situated testimony, where we use a 3D model to reconstruct the site of events. And this reconstruction helps us show how um, the, the, the police brutality incident is met with further police brutality, and it helps Trina reconstruct this whole scene and, and kind of combine footage with her own um, reconstruction here. And finally, I'm going a bit quickly, because uh, I think we're running out of time, but um, finally in the years chapter, we are contextualizing this killing within a history of police violence in the South Shore neighborhood. I'm tracing it back to the 1919 riots that followed the murder by stoning of young Eugene Williams. This three-day uh, race um, uh, race riot led to the uh, 38 people led to the killing of 38 people and 537 people injured, as well as more than a thousand Black Chicagoans who were homeless. So this is Adam Green, a historian at the University of Chicago, which explains this. The riot um, as a public emergency is met by a set of very dramatic and, as I understand it, unprecedented police decisions. One of them was to establish a cordon, what was called a dead zone, around the existing sort of concentrated black residential community known as the Black Belt. That decision, a policy decision, which objectively could be understood in the moment as having some merits, mm -hmm was one that ultimately kind of resulted in the first citywide scale example of differential policing. And that differential policing is going to be something that's going to be instituted, that's going to be embraced, that's going to be understood as the code of the police rather than something that's an anomaly of police conduct. So I don't, how am I doing with time, Mond or someone? Do you have another Good. five minutes? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I just wanted to show you then uh, how this investigation was released. Um, so we were invited to do this investigation also by uh, the Chicago Architectural Biennial. And uh, together with the Invisible Institute, as we were working on this, we started feeling increasingly weary of how it would be like to exhibit uh, such a difficult um, investigation with, with imagery of a black man being shot in an, um, an exhibition that essentially uh, acts almost like as a marketplace of ideas where people kind of go through a uh, project after project after project and uh, essentially don't really have the, the kind of attention that is necessary to watch this, this sort of imagery. So we start, started feeling a little bit uncomfortable with exposing visitors uh, to this imagery without their consent. So instead, we, together with the curators of the Chicago Architectural Biennial, we decided to, in fact, not show any of the videos that we had produced for this investigation on the um, exhibition, but in instead display kind of uh, the text that we're describing each of those chapters, so the, um, from the milliseconds all the way to the years, and as well as a text that, that explained why we would re retrieve and not show um, the imagery. Of course, the investigation is available online on our website, as, as are all our investigations. Anyone can have access to it. And it was also shown at the offices of the Invisible Institute, which is located at the South Shore neighborhood. But that was also um, possible for someone to visit um, by making a, a meeting and by also having some of the researchers always there that were able to kind of explain 
that story. So it was a more protected way of showing it. And this idea is really asking um, reintroducing this this uh, idea of, of um, giving consent to watching that footage. So thinking about the necessity to see this footage, but the impossibility to look. We also produced this um, audio piece that we exhibited at the Biennial that explained this, this difficulty. And uh, here I will let it play. It's the voices of, um, of uh, Will Calloway, a community activist who was really crucial in, in, in releasing the footage, who had really advocated for that, as well as the voice of Audrey Petty, a kind of a, a poet and uh, who lives in the neighborhood, who's explaining why she didn't want to watch it. Today, I did file the Freedom of Information Act uh, with my attorney, and we are demanding that the Chicago Police Department release all body cam, dash cam, and surveillance footage of that shooting. We're so tired. We're tired of community violence, and we're tired of police violence. We don't trust what they say. We do not trust what Chicago Police Department say. Show us. Don't wait 60 days. Show us now. Show the community now. Show us what you all see. We want to see what you see. Show us that it was justified. And we want that footage to be released immediately for true transparency purposes. We don't want to wait. It wasn't even a decision that I announced to anyone, but at a certain point I knew I couldn't, I couldn't watch, I couldn't watch black men being murdered. Like I knew, I just, I will, you know, I will be responsible and I will learn the things that I can learn um, and be informed. But I, I, I reached a point where I just could not, I could not do it. I really, I mean, I think at that same moment, I was trying to learn as much about him as I could. It wasn't a turning away, it was really going towards certain things. And I was on Twitter and I was listening to people's accounts and I was listening to people who were, you know, at the demonstration and I was trying to learn about him. But when, the, when, the, when it was released, it was not, it was not the thing I, I wanted to access. So, so here you see this kind of tension between um, how important it is to be able to see, to be able to judge for, for oneself, but at the same time, how this uh, visualization, this creating of an image somehow infiltrates also the mind as another way of creating terror. And so there's a resistance towards that. So um, this is the exhibition at the Invisible Institute. Um, which was kind of like a much more private setting, as we said. And, and this investigation essentially also was used in order to support the legal claims that the family is taking forward. And it has also spurred investigations from the mayor of Chicago, the Civilian Office for Police Accountability, and the Chicago Police Department. So you see how one, um, one investigation, essentially a multi-part investigation, is both kind of... Um, uh, activating different lenses to, of analysis in order to, to describe the ways that that um, this one incident takes place in space and time, but but through very different connects to very different types of histories and the very different types of strategies and techniques of concealing what was essentially uh, the fault of the police, and also how it it becomes how it creates a certain impact through being entered into series of different forums. So um, just to conclude, I wanted to, to go back to this idea of the operative uh, models. And this is a, a concept that I'm, I'm kind of working on a little bit now also for my own PhD. And, um, and to trace it back to the way that um, operative alludes to, um, to, it's kind of borrowed almost but alludes to the, to the term operational images that was introduced by Harun Faraki to describe images that are part of a process. So um, these are images that are often not destined for human eyes, that are rather machinic. 
you think you can think, for example, of drone imagery um, that informs predictive models and instructs uh, assassination tactics. This is the context within which Faraki was was kind of introducing it. So, what does it mean to have images images that are not destined for us but are actually part of this machining process? But with operative, uh, what uh, I'd like to suggest um, is a shift from operational to operative, which essentially means um, it is an invitation to focus on the way that images um, and furthermore, further more kind of models um, from, from this is the way that I'm, I'm trying to kind of expand the term, have an active political life. So to be operative is not just being kind of a cog in the wheel, so to speak, but it is about um, creating a, a certain difference, creating, uh, becoming actionable. The way that uh, the models are actionable and have a life of their own uh, is their political life, right? So my interest somehow lies in, in, in thinking about how we can conceptually understand these modeling practices and think of modeling not only on the on the basis of kind of what we do but also think about and perhaps this is some an area that we could expand further maybe in the discussion but think about also the way that we can understand um operative models also as um as in the words of tiago branco for example the neuroscientist each one of us have a world model within our brains right the way that we think the way that we make decisions is um based on a certain simulation of the world around us a certain way of of kind of sampling the world picking up images and making them into mental images that then at any given moment when we have to make a decision we simulate a series of scenarios. We, we try to work out what would have happened if this, this, and this, and that um, takes place. So the way that, that the brain itself is kind of media, the way it's representation of the world that, that we have experienced, everything that we've ever seen and felt and, and um, heard is somehow um, captured within a memory. Um, and then that the way that this also kind of informs future decisions by simulating, by predicting futures is somehow an operative function. And so I think what, the way that we could think about operative models is one that, that kind of transverses the scales from the very internal model of the brain to the model that is presented, physical model or digital model that is presented in order to host a debate, discussion, um, a certain kind of... Um
flout this idea that every project that happens has a stance, right? The way that you convey information, the way you focus the lenses or put the light on certain amounts of information showcases that. So my question would be, how do you balance that accuracy, inaccuracy, you know, these, you know, these noise within these fields that you have to deal with. And I guess throughout the projects that you've done, um, how do you come into terms with it as well? Mm, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I guess it's, um, it's also a race, you know, it's a race to, to be able to, um, to be able to create work that, uh, that allows this verification, right? One of our techniques is called open verification. And the idea is that we triangulate um, at any given moment, the way to verify um, an event is by taking different sources, triangulating them and verifying it from, from multiple different perspectives. But we also um, somehow, it's, it's very labor intensive, right? It's, it takes a lot to do that. And that's why um, in parallel to that, we're trying to kind of cultivate a certain culture of understanding. So most of our videos are also kind of part tutorials for someone to be able to do this themselves and to be able to judge for themselves whether what they're seeing is actually truthful or, or to at least kind of cultivate a certain way of seeing that, um, that will help them be more um, critical to what, to what they're seeing. Although it is somehow increasingly more difficult to do this, as mm. you say, with, with the fakes and the way that technology um, somehow makes it um, much, more, much more concealed as a process. So, so um, for us, it's also always a, an issue of like finding multiple different ways to, to make sure that what we're seeing is true. But at the same time, um, there, we also don't agree, as, as I said, in, of this idea of an objective truth. Mm. Um, and in fact, what, what we're really analyzing, and this here, you know, we're also kind of drawing on the work of um, Donna Haraway, who talks about situated perspectives and thinks about uh, kind of countering this uh, hegemonic kind of gaze, the, the idea of, a, of an all-seeing eye of God, which somehow um, usually is, um, is kind of the bird's eye view of, of the architectural model, right? What, who is that, right? Who, who comes from that? And she argues that usually this is um, a kind of a white male able-bodied uh, person who assumes this position of the universal. This is mm. what a human means, right? In, in the, in, within uh, modernism and etc. So her idea of, um, her idea of, a, of kind of a feminist way of, of doing objective truth is to think about situatedness and to think about how each perspective is partial, but actually situating it allows you to, to be more truthful about what, what it can derive, what it can say, not acting like we, we see the whole picture, but understanding that it's a partial view allows us to actually complete it with other partial views and construct this narrative. So I think here's also where models come into play because it's not about kind of creating a montage and creating an illusion of this is the narrative, but allowing it to be an open way of accessing information means to essentially anyone can, can understand how they all connect. And that's really important for, for verification work because essentially we're not asking you to trust us because we're experts. We're asking you to understand the technique, understand the method, and be able to, to be convinced yourself or not, but to be able to kind of access it in your own terms. I don't mm. know if this is exactly what you were referring to. Yeah, it's, no. it's, I think it's a multi-part question. We could talk yeah, about Yeah, no, it. absolutely. And, and I think um, this idea that representation is now a formulated part of the evidence that you're, that you're building is, is super fascinating. And it's a new way of looking at how these operative models that we do make can be provided to things that usually people shut away from, you know, mm -hmm. that I feel that could be put into the highlight of, of view. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, um, I mean, Mon just used the word representations and I'm kind of curious because you, in your lecture, you actually never used that word representation, you used the word modeling. Um, which I thought is very interesting because there is clearly, in my mind, there's a very clear distinction between the two. And I like the way that you talk about it as kind of a nonlinear 
associations technique. So in the sense, it, it almost erase or, or um, like say, it's kind of um, bias, so to speak, and you're trying to objectify it in, 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 in a certain way. Um, I want to ask you about these notions of, um, and kind of maybe related to the, what Mom was talking about earlier, these notions of hypothesis, because in, in unit one um, um, in this visiting school, in fact, just today and yesterday, we were actually looking at very similar kind of um, biopolitical kind of situation. We're looking at um, restraint and, and um, isolation chamber in mental health um, in, in, in Australia and how um, we are working with um, colleagues from um, Melbourne School of uh, Nursing to look at how um, restraints is actually a violate, a, what, what makes people comfortable in care, in, in hospital care, but also in kind of um, individual kind of care environment. And we just have all our students um, looking at this sort of almost exactly what you guys were doing, kind of this sort of very forensic kind of trying to be objectified. And the question today came out in terms of students kind of jump into conclusions with diagrams. And I think it's increasingly more and more um, in my mind, um, like say it's um, easy to do because, you know, um, and I guess I, I'm, I'm interested in how far in your work and also in forensics architecture's work, um, the notion of a hypothesis um, comes reasonably early as a, perhaps as an operative ideas or as a seed for other operations, so to speak, uh, before you become operative. Um, mm. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, this earlier conception, and maybe it has a kind of a link to one of the questions that's on the Cal Q&A on the notion of bias and how to eliminate or avoid bias when presenting information. Yes. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think um, we usually, let's say from forensic architecture's perspective, which might be a little bit different to doing work within a university kind of, uh, you know, a student's project. Although forensic architecture is based in, in Goldsmiths University of London, but it has kind of a different model of practice. It's a, it's a bit um, independent in that sense. From forensic architecture's perspective, we usually kind of um, come to an investigation when there has been kind of a, an invitation by a community uh, on the ground or when there has been an invitation, uh, when, when, when there's suspicion that there is, there has been state violence, right? And I think that's um, that's key. And we we do trust when we start the investigation. We do trust that the the voices from the ground that say that um, there has been some violence here, right? And um, we trust them usually because they have uh, again this this um, situated knowledge that is somehow most often ignored. And so our work there is always coming in. Um, in order to provide the, the analytic, evidentiary um, kind of layer to something that people already know. So within that, that comes with a question that could, we could say that this is a hypothesis because until we've pro proven this, until we've proven with our techniques, we cannot really support it. But we, we somehow start with trust. And then, of course, there might be kind of details that end up being distorted. And this might be because of bias, but this might also be because there's trauma involved. And um, the moment that uh, the experience of any given incident, when you have the shock of what is happening to you, is completely distorted. For example, um, for example time is never quite, um, uh, it's never, doesn't, get captured very very well within memory it gets very easily uh, distorted when you ask someone what time something happens and you know they're fleeing their homes because they're being bombed they could tell you a time it's it's most often will be wrong if you ask them how long did the event last they might say an hour it might have been two two minutes you know it's it's something that that comes with the experience and and in fact those distortions and those the, the fact that there is inaccuracy and that there is error is often evidence that there has been violence involved. So we don't, we're not looking for a perfect testimony because a perfect testimony or a perfect account is something that, that takes away the human experience. And in fact, 
it, it, there is no such thing. Usually a perfect testimony is from someone who's lying and has rehearsed the whole thing very well, right? So we think about how we, we can in fact support a partial perspective rather than, than kind of doubt it and challenge it. So it's, you know, bias in a way, I, I guess there's again multiple ways to answer this question, but is it bias or is it, or is it our human inability to capture detail in the machinic way, right? Um, and then again, of course, we could think that us as investigators have a bias. First of all, we're sympathetic to, to what we're investigating, right? And that might make us partially blind, but, but essentially what the process of doing this work does is we, the work of, of, because the work is interdisciplinary, it allows us to have multiple different lenses through which to challenge it. So let's think about the journalistic lens. Let's think about the architectural lens. Let's think about the, the one that understands film and the, the, the way that film is composed. Let's think about um, software development. Let's, let's think about uh, the legal perspective. Once you apply all of those filters and you, you kind of challenge and almost kind of cross-examine, in a, you, you play the devil's advocate. We play the devil's advocate to each other in, in, our, um, in our group. Um, then essentially you have a stronger case. And this is quite important for us because if we don't see the faults of our own investigation, most definitely someone else will. So it's a process of doing, making the work strong to be able to challenge it from multiple perspectives. So this, this is from um, uh, FA's perspective. I don't know if this is kind of enough. Uh, from, a, from a student's perspective also, it's a really difficult moment to know when your hypothesis is. It's also a question of how do you approach a project? How do you approach an open brief? How do you allow people the, the freedom to kind of arrive at their own projects or their own interests? And I guess it's, it's slightly different, but, um, but I would say there's always a moment where we ask for students also to connect to a struggle on the ground because that makes, that makes every project more important and, and sharper immediately because the questions that are asked from the ground are really crucial. It's not just a theory. No, I, I think what, uh, what you say is uh, super interesting. Um, and I'm wondering in how far, um, so, I mean, this is a question from um, Donald Bakes, who's our uh, professor here, um, mm -hmm. on um, validity and factualities. Um, and he says that, um, I'm just going to read part of it for you. He says, I'm thinking of this um, in relationship to the assessment of JFK, the many investigations, numerous deeply scientific analysis of Jeff Rundes, films, sounds, testimonies, photos, accounts, and yet we still don't know what happened. Is it the weight of evidence or the obviousness of the evidence that produce a realistic conclusions or something else? Mm. The weight of evidence. Um, I mean, for me, it's... Are it's they neither... all equal in, 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 in the investigations, um, I guess? Uh, I guess it's, I mean, it's, it's a good question. There, you know, there's moments where I'm not, I'm not going to kind of underestimate how much power there is in editing and how much you could create multiple narratives based on the same, uh, the same evidence, right? At the same time, for, for me, it's not about, um, it's not about weight or obviousness, but for me, it would be about um, cross-referring. For me, it's how many, how many layers verify the same thing. If it's just, the, that's the problem also for um, when, you, when you have footage of a killing, when you have foot, uh, footage of, you know, even you think about the, um, the George Floyd, the Eric Gardner, like all of those, uh, all of those, um, Michael Brown, for example, there was footage of that moment, which should have been enough to, to be able to convict the police officers, but it failed. Why did it fail? Because you could narrate, you can interpret the same footage in multiple ways, even though the evidence was so strong, it's a question of, it was a singular piece of evidence, which means that you can kind of overlay it with multiple different narratives and get a different result, which is of course what we're struggling for. But at the same time, the evidence itself, the primary evidence is incredibly important, but it's very rarely you find 
all you need to know about an incident in a singular piece of evidence. Usually you need to reconstruct it and you need to cross-reference it. And the moment that you have five, six, 10 different sources that are pointing towards the same thing, it's in fact the way that, that um, there's, it kind of, it's linked, it's, it's media's, mediatized um, and it's kind of, um, it's captured by different perspectives that's what makes it convincing in our case. This is how we, we argue for it. And this is also how we've managed to, to do so in court, for example. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just, so it's a matter of kind of like unraveling the web rather than kind of finding the, the, the um, trophy uh, piece of footage. Um, I, I think there's one thing that you also look towards is this notions of um, input from different experts and multidisciplinary approach to analyzing and unfolding or unpacking the evidence in layers. Um, and in a sense, um, expert opinions, ex you know, almost kind of the justice systems um, become this layering or, or way of kind of triangulating the evidence to a sense of um, quote unquote truth. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about. Um, when do you bring in collaborations? Is it at the early onset or is there much more a responsive, a response to the evidence as in the sense the evidence becomes operative um, notions to trigger um, the experts? Um, would you maybe talk about their relationships? Mm, yeah, I mean, it, it really is, it's a case of, of um, establishing the research question, very clearly so. It depends on what uh, the case is and what we need to work with. Um, you know, we, when, when it's about analyzing film, then filmmakers are the best ones who know how film operates and understand what, what the difference is between, uh, you know, uh, uh, 25 frames per second or 33 frames per second, right? Like how we might lose a crucial piece of evidence because the, the resolution is different or they understand all sorts of kind of interlacing that might happen that might create an illusion of, for example, we see one bomb falling, but it, it appears as if it's two bombs because of the interlacing uh, that happens in the media, right? So um, in this case, it's really about what is the question when, we, when, we are, um, when we're thinking about, uh, for example, um, submitting to, to court, because this is, this is where the, the most important um, forum is for this particular case. It's not always that courts are the best place to, to argue for a case. Sometimes they're incredibly biased. For example, you know, work on Palestine, we almost, we rarely submit that to Israeli courts because Israeli courts doesn't recognize Palestinian rights. So how could we even um, argue for it when there is kind of fundamental uh, bias? Um, so if we do work in court, then we definitely need uh, legal scholars and, and uh, litigators to work with us. Um, in the case here of uh, Harith Augustus, at some point we were questioning the idea of a split-second decision, um, you know, from from its um, from on its core, let's say, because the the idea of a split-second decision has been used in almost every police killing. It's always a question of instincts. It's always a question of it was just a split, uh, you know, a split moment. The decision was made, it was self-defense, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we want to question, like, how could it be that it's always black people who are being, um, uh, who are being murdered on split-second decisions, right? How do we even access that? And to do that, we need to go to the brain. We need to understand how a decision like this is made. And therefore, we kind of made a connection with Tiago Branco. Who, who has done kind of extensive research on, on, um, on this sort of processes. And so it's, it's really a question of where are we looking at any given moment and what is it that we need to analyze? Sometimes it's about sound. Sometimes the most crucial piece of evidence is how something is, is heard and how you could detect a certain quality or, or a certain kind of like trace of, a, of an event on the background. And there we need acoustic experts. We need to know whether something's perceptible so we need to understand how, for example, the smell of a gunshot dissipates in a room. We work with a fluid dynamics expert because we need to simulate the cloud of smoke. And in order to kind of see uh, the moment that someone enters into a room, would they be able to detect it? 
So it's really about formulating the right research question, the research question that would unlock the investigation, and then inviting people who have an expertise and being really honest with how we only know so much, we cannot do this work alone, right? We, we, need, to, we need to collaborate. Yeah, I think it's uh, fantastic. Um, well, I mean, I have lots of questions. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I was just going to sort of add in there this, like the, the process almost is like the evidence and these puzzle of layers that come through. Um, but one thing that is quite interesting for me is like the vessel or medium on how you reveal your proposition right? Like, like the, the way that you sort of navigate yourselves within, I guess, the context is through like art, exhibitions, galleries, as well as the courthouse and that. I, I just want to maybe let you unpack that a little bit. Like, why would you do exhibitions about these things? Is it more about awareness? Is it, is it for the general public to learn? Or is it just, um, I guess, the method? Or is that the ultimate site that you're trying to reveal? And it may tie in with this process idea that you're talking about, how the way that you actually present the evidence is actually showing how it works so people would actually understand the multi-layered approach. Um, but I thought I mean, it might be a good way for you just to unpack it and then you know, think about ways of delivering the projects in, I guess, today's context. Absolutely. Do you think I have time to share one slide? Sure. Yes, go for it. Okay, give me one second. Yes, I think it makes a lot of, um, it's quite important to think about um, different forums as also imperfect forums. There's not one place that is able to, um, that is able to really um, find, like deliver justice, in, a, in an ideal way. Let me show you this, sorry. That's a bit of a heavy image, but essentially what you see here is a diagram we created for, um, this is the, the lifeline of a project, the Halit Yozgad investigation that I showed you with the, the one-to-one -one model. And this is really, the, the red line is the, the life of the project. So what you see is, we are operating in legal forums, political forums, civil society forums, cultural forums, media forums, and each one of those places is offering something different, right? So the investigation, so the killing uh, happened over here, the killing of Khalid Yozgat. Within civil society, there were multiple initiatives uh, that were advocating that this was a racial killing. Um, the Turkish community in Germany was, was uh, from the very beginning, knew that they were being targeted, yet the police was, uh, was saying that um, it's actually um, a kind of a, a crime of Turkish mafia. Um, and then essentially, the, the, it was revealed that it was a neo-Nazi party that was targeting those, a neo-Nazi group that was targeting those, uh, those people. And then within the media, uh, there was a leak that's of, of court documents that allowed us to do the, our investigation. And from then onwards, we, we collaborated with the People's Tribunal. We first presented our results in a People's Tribunal, uh, but we also were able to do this one-to-one -one construction in the House of World Cultures in, in Berlin, which is an, a cultural space. So the cultural space essentially allows us, gives us the, the opportunity to build something. They have the capacity, they have they have the resources, they know how to put up exhibitions um, up quickly. This was never exhibited as a one-to-one -one model, but it was, we were able to kind of create this installation in order to test this. And then we've also done press conferences. And then we also presented after the People's Tribunal, we presented it in Documenta 14, which is kind of a huge art show, happens every, four, uh, every five years in, in Kassel. And it happens to be in Kassel, so just a few blocks away from where the murder took place. And there you have an art show and you have a piece of evidence that is inserted with it. Somehow, because the art show has a million viewers, this creates political movement. So the, the space that we, we were exhibiting it became a space where our partners and activists from the ground, from the People's Tribunal, would bring in police investigators, journalists, MPs, who would come and see the evidence in inside 
uh, this space inside the art show. And then from then onwards, we were invited to, to present this also in a parliamentary inquiry. And earlier, we had also been invited to present it in the court case which ended up not happening because of a technical reason, but it's from a press conference that we're invited in the court case. It's from an art show that we're invited in the parliamentary inquiry. So what you see here as this kind of fluid diagram is what is necessary to do counter investigative work. If we were only operating within a kind of, a, if we were kind of a state led uh, agency, if the, if the prosecutor kind of uh, commissioned us, we would do our report, we would present it in the court case, it would be kind of a linear process. It would have kind of yielded a little bit for or against, et cetera, et cetera. But here, because we don't have access to those spaces, we need to diversify. And this here's, you know, we, I use this, um, this metaphor that they use in the Hong Kong protest, you move like water, no? And then, um, and then we find a way to create political pressure points. And, and that's, how you, that's how you make a difference because you, it's, it's, you're always coming from outside. Anyway, further than that, I think it's also, for us, it's really uh, the cultural space is also a place of reflection. It's a place where we're able to, um, to talk to people directly in a way that we can't do in the media. In the media, someone writes an article, you have a very particular attention span of, of, um, of people reading reading this in a court case, how many people go and visit court cases? Have you ever been to a court case? It's, it's very rare that people actually go and listen through these proceedings, but within a cultural space, within an art space, within a seminar space, we're able to actually have a conversation and talk about what it means to do this work, what it means to, to experience those events, and then unpack it really even in what tools do we use to do this work and are we doing a good job? Are we kind of thinking about our techniques about how we, representation of violence, for example, vestitization of violence, which is a huge question for us always. Do we make it into something prettier or do we, how, do, why, why do we even use a visual register to talk about these events? And so there we're able to explain and understand like, what is the, pro, how, how, what do we show and what do we not show, right? That, that question that we had in the Chicago Architectural Biennial. Are we making a mistake with showing too much? That's also part of the, that's come, coming from this conversation, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I really, kind of, I respect kind of the ethical stance and I think that not showing the image, the film is a smart choice for the Chicago Biennale. Um, I, I just maybe want to have one more question to conclude. Um, we're slightly running over time, but if you can bear with us. Um, and there's a question for, uh, on, from Donald Bakes, again, on terms of research questions that you were talking about earlier. Um, and um, the question here is, if for most advocacy work, most social conflict, resolution, justice, for example, doesn't talk about the work as research, but as a search for truth or justice. And the question really is about what is the difference between your notion of research? And I maybe just, I will probably hijack that little question a little bit. And because you are also PhD candidates and a scholars, um, and you talk about these notions of biopolitics, and maybe we can talk extend that into your PhD um, arena? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Um, I think it, it's, it's a good question. I think there's any project that we do has a couple of layers. First of all, it's a question of figuring out what happened in this particular incident, right? It's a question of how do we derive um, the most accurate understanding of the event. And that is perhaps more towards the idea of search of truth and search of justice. Beyond that though, for us, it's always a question because we are a research agency, because we're, our mandate is to create and, um, and disseminate new evidentiary techniques, new ways of understanding evidence. Beyond the kind of very particulars of figuring out what happened, we also have the layer of trying to develop new techniques and methodologies of, of understanding the nature of evidence itself, right? So in that sense, each project that we take on also um, needs to have a layer of what is it that we can say that's different now? Because we're a small organization, this is really kind of the way that we're built. Um, because we're a small organization, we cannot have coverage. We cannot say, we will say everything we, we cannot 
you know, even to be honest, even big organizations like Amnesty cannot really have coverage of everything that is happening at any given moment. But the way that we are dealing with this is we're choosing kind of, we're choosing very strategically which investigations we take on because we can't take them all on, unfortunately. But we're thinking about which one of those investigations we can develop new techniques in order to be able to, to kind of um, work on something and then let others take it on board. So now we've had um, multiple uh, partners who are doing similar work. We have Bellingcat who are doing open source research. We have the New York Times that has a visual investigations unit that is kind of very much kind of informed by what we do. We've, we've been in touch with them from the very beginning. And so, and there's others also within journalism that are really following up this example. So hopefully they're able to, to take on cases. So it's not just about talking about the particularities of the case, but it allows us the freedom to be able to, to develop more because there's always, there's always new techniques, as Mom was saying, there's always new media that makes it difficult. So the research for us actually is quite key. It's not about um, switching off and and thinking only about activism it's not it's never only it's never only research it's never only activism it's never only politics it's never only architectural methodologies it's never only academia etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, even you know in um, just to say in my in my own uh, phd work it's a question of how and i think this is something we take on board quite seriously how do we use the different tools, whether it's theoretical tools, whether it's concepts, whether it's it's theories of analyzing power, which is what Foucault was doing with biopolitics and what many others have done. Um, how do we use those tools as a way to to kind of um, to ground them into into work that has an actual impact? For me, it's uh, although I'm fascinated with philosophy, for example, I'm. I'm kind of really uh, excited to read some of those theories. Sometimes the, the translation for me always is how useful is this to, to things that are happening on the moment and, and how could we, we kind of activate those tools politically? Because if we can't, then it ends up being about talking to each other and it's kind of a, a game we play within academia. But when we can, then it, it gains all of the power of the world because you, you have a fresh perspective into an old conflict. And that's really it's 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 where it's where you actually see some some things happening, some some difference, something some impact could be made. We can't ask for a lot, but this little kind of there's little victories that we can we can be happy with. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and that was probably time in terms of the entire session that we had, but. I, I just wanted to say such a thank you to all the work that you've done over the past, you know, how many years that we've been talking about. Um, and I think moving onwards in just in relation to the sort of agenda that we're running at New Paper, this idea of new media and the ways of different techniques and seeing it play out in the industry in different ways and even how you even map different cultural forums, political forums, societal forums, and that as a different form of site that you navigate is something that the students should definitely look at and maybe even reconsider what the architect can be rather than a building as the only outcome of what it is. We can start thinking about action as part of the form or a way of thinking about this way of process as evidence. So I guess without further ado, I'll just thank you so much for your time, Christina. I'm sure that we can discuss this to the wee hours of the night. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Christina. I mean, we deeply appreciate the, the time for the lectures and I'm just going to share my screen um, to also advertise the upcoming series of lecture as part of the Bay Visiting School. So tomorrow night, um, join us again online for Stefan Lennox and Pablo Sesanto on the Bioculture, Architecture, Land, Politics and Multispecies. And on Thursday night, which is the 8th of July, um, we'll be hosting Daniela Mitzberger and Tiziano Derma, who is also the unit uh, leader for the A-Visiting School last year, titled 90 Tongues, 656 Hours, 51 Elements and 20 People. This is on their ben current Venice Biennale installation called The Magic Queen. Um, promised to be a fantastic um, lectures by Daniela and Tiziano. 
And that's also the night, um, same night as our MSTX um, exhibitions. And the following week, we on the 12th of July, we will have Stellar um, talking about embodiments, aliveness, and agency, zombie, cyborg, and chima chimeras. Um, so Stellar's event will actually be a hybrid event. So we'll both um, in person at the Melbourne School of Design. So if you are in Melbourne, please join us on campus at the Melbourne School of Design for this lecture. You can register both online as well. Um, and following that, we have two more lectures, one by our founder, Vival, Nera and Oscar uh, Johansson on unnatural disaster. Also, Adolfo and Oscar are also both um, our um, unit masters and unit leader for one of our unit at this year, a visiting school. And last but not least is Emmanuel Cole um, on AI sampling on plasticities and form. So before I leave you, I will also like to promote and encourage everybody here to register for the MSTX winter launch, which is happening this Thursday, 8th of July. And please register online. There are a multitude of events happening, um, including some super cool DJ lineup. So uh, be sure to register and join us online. I'd like to again thank Christina for your time and a fantastic lectures. The Q&A are still flowing in. So I'm very sorry for those um, questions that we couldn't answer online. Um, we'll, we promise to get you over when um, we can fly again and we can then hopefully have um, conversations over whiskey and dinner. All right. Thank you, so thank you everybody. Thank you for, thank you, Christina.